afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank Andy for uh, organising this. I was at TAG in 1987. Uh, were you born in 1987? I was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> were you born in TAG? Anyway, it's a, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, my interest and the excuse for being here is really that I'm a mountaineer and I'm fascinated by the possibility that we can start to understand how prehistoric people, specifically in this country, um, but maybe there are applications elsewhere, uh, view mountains. And the Lake District uh, in uh, the UK is a very good place to start um, for reasons which will become clear, I hope. <laughs> All right. For those of you who don't know where it is, there it is. Now, I'm starting from the datum of the Neolithic, but really uh, what I'm going to describe is a new discovery which was made by myself, um, and I roped in a, a number of other people to help me understand it because I'm not very techy in the, na the ways that I need to be. Um, but I was walking, as one does in the Lake District, and um, I found, found this piece of, of rock art, and it was completely different to anything I'd found or seen in the literature before, which always is very suspicious. Um, so, inevitably, one goes to the literature to try and uh, provide a context for this kind of uh, discovery. And most of the work that's been done uh, in the Lake District on um, the archaeology of the High Fells, the mountains of the, of the Lake District core, uh, has, has focused on uh, um, the uh, Neolithic uh, so-called axe industry or axe factories, um, which um, from excavations, uh, particularly in the 1990s, are understood to have uh, commenced their <coughs> operation, not that I um, regard this as being a correct term, uh, in the early 4th millennium BC. So on the slide here, uh, you've got uh, the uh, Langdale Pikes, um, down here, um, mountains going up to about maybe 2,000 feet, uh, and you've got high on the uh, slopes of the pike here, really high up, about 800 feet up, 1,800 feet up, um, massive uh, debitage from the production of hundreds, of, if not thousands, of axes. Uh, and um, this is remarkable uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It was one of the largest axe factories, one of 26. Um, so-called axe factories, sorry to keep using that term, uh, in the UK. Uh, and in 1988, uh, it was uh, established that maybe 21% um, of the UK's <coughs> axes came from this one source. Um, so they, this is a classic so-called Neolithic datum. Um, you've got some dates, you've got some excavations, and then the top part of this, the picture, you've got two classic uh, Neolithic stone circles. Uh, top uh, left is uh, Castle Rig near Keswick, uh, top right is, uh, is Swinside near Mullen. Uh, uh, incredibly uh, remarkable sites, and again, it is, we have no dating evidence from these, but suppose that the products of the axes, like factories went out through, uh, or were distributed through these um, stone circles, a very simplistic idea. And um, interestingly, these sites goes back into the 19th century. Um, here you see from uh, Archaeologia 44 in 1873, uh, some images of some of the polished uh, stone axes. Unfortunately, I don't have any photographs of the axe, axes themselves, but they are absolutely remarkable. Um, they're made out of a specific blue-green volcanic tuff, which is uh, extremely beautiful. Uh, most of the products nowadays are patinated, so you can't tell the colour of them. Uh, but anyway, you can see that in land reclamation, uh, in the 19th century, they were finding uh, these products. Nobody knew where they were coming from then, but it was surmised that they were coming from the mountains because of the stone. And you can even see um, the uh, preservation of a haft, of one of the axes there. So that's that. And then near the Langdale Pikes, which are in the background on this picture, uh, there are some massive boulders a bit further down the valley. And the boulder with the climber on, the pink climber, just there, in the 1990s, uh, people spotted uh, some rock art on this boulder. Uh, it's not been seen before, and this is surprising because lots of people visit the Lake District, but anyway, they found rock art on this, this boulder. Um, this is not a great picture of it, I'm afraid, but I've tried to 
indicate the complexity of it in the upper panel there. Uh, that's a, a transcription by Stan Beckinsall. Uh, so you've got traditional uh, British rock art here, uh, spirals, uh, concentric circles, cut marks, linear uh, features, all the standard repertoire and um, uh, various uh, interpreters of this have said that it's similar to passage grave art. I wouldn't like to comment on that at the moment, but this is a traditional uh, British abstract <laughs> rock art panel. Now, <clears throat> to move away from this completely, uh, the, the Langhill Pikes are not the highest ground in the Lake District, and they're not the only ground in the lakes where the uh, Axe volcanic tuff was located. <coughs> uh, the Scorfell Massif, which uh, contains England's highest mountain, Scorfell Pike, um, is clearly visible from the Langdale Pikes. The pikes are just there, and this photograph is taken from the summit of Scorfell Pike. And um, people were obviously working uh, this specific seam of volcanic axe tuff in the Neolithic uh, from the high highest fells. And you can see how uh, monumental the, the, the sites actually are and, and the location. But this wasn't really what was interesting me. Uh, what was happening, uh, or what was interesting to me in particular, was what was uh, happening much lower down in this kind of area here. Um, and that is Upper Eskdale. Upper Eskdale is uh, scenically the uh, English equivalent of the um, American Monument Valley, uh, but it's virtually unknown um, because it's so remote and unfrequented. Um, it's about 15 square kilometres of rough grazing, well above um, uh, most evidence for cultivation. There's limited medieval and post-medieval evidence for activity up here, but it's very limited to things like peat cutting and boundary wall creation, and with the occasional shielding. And I thought, this is a huge blank on the map, and it was obviously related to where the axes were, because people would have been moving up through this landscape to get to where the axes were which is why I decided to have a look at it. And uh, I found a cairn. <coughs> Let's go back a bit. Um, you see that big rock there, about 200 feet high, that's Scar Lathing. I found a cairn uh, just behind the summit of Scar Lathing. Um, and you can see from the location, it's extremely unusual. It's pointing very steeply downhill. Uh, in fact, if you're not careful, you fall off the edge uh, when you're trying to look at it. Um, pointing uh, due south and orientated north-south. And um, Aaron Watson uh, thankfully produced this photogrammetric survey of it. Um, it's very heavily overgrown, but basically it's uh, trapezoidal. You can just make out the limits of it there. It's about 4 metres wide at that point, and about 3.8 metres wide there, and about 16 metres long. But the significant thing that I spotted about uh, on the cairn was this. It's a kind of row of boulders, just there. And um, there they are. They don't look great, do they? I mean, they, they look very boring. But in actual fact, they're alternate colours, going back to uh, what was said earlier about coloration and colour scapes. That's quite interesting. There's a tan orange, grey white, tan orange, grey white. This is all Borodale volcanic rock, which is not susceptible to being carved into anything. What we saw before was a percussion on the rock surface in Great Langdale. This lot go back 400 odd million years, and it's not uh, the kind of surface that you want to carve on. But uh, the one rock behind this ranging, uh, sorry, this walking pole here, did turn out to be quite interesting. It doesn't look much there. Um, this is uh, photogrammetry. Again, courtesy of uh, Aaron Watson. Um, but you could probably just make out some interesting markings on the rock and some al also some extremely obvious laminations on it. So I um, naively decided to try and trace the, um, the markings and uh, that, that's what they look like uh, with the scale on it. This is only about 60 centimetres long, this boulder, and it's about 24 centimetres thick, so one person could not carry it, but two people conceivably could. Uh, I'm not sure whether that makes it portable or not. But anyway, there's very interesting uh, markings. Uh, so we had another look at it, and Aaron produced this really good kind of uh, reflectance transformation image of it uh, using um, up-to-date software, which I'd never heard of before. And uh, I put my... Uh, transcription on the, on the right-hand side of the screen there. And you can clearly see that there are some very interesting 
um, engravings on the surface of this rock, and uh, I've lifted out quite deliberately what I consider to be an anthropomorphic figure or face uh, on the uh, the right hand side there, picked out in uh, in red. Uh, this is a kind of close up of that image. Um, I've uh, cheekily stuck in an image from the folk and drums, a well known Neolithic artifact, on the uh, left hand side to give you some kind of uh, point at, uh, uh, to target me on. <laughs> but I'm not convinced that that is uh, an answer to what we're seeing here. But it's very striking that, that this uh, image kind of leaps out at you from the rock um, imaging that we've conducted so far. Well, I would stress that we haven't, um, going back to the representation versus materiality argument, we haven't done any more work on this at the moment. The photogrammetry was only completed about a month ago, and we're preparing a paper on this for PPS, so and there's a lot more work to do yet. But I want to uh, to close. How much time have we got left, Danny? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, great. I want to close by going back a bit to consider what that monument uh, has in terms of context and also what the uh, rock itself, uh, the materiality of the rock and its significance in terms of its selection in the, in the landscape uh, might mean. So this we were looking at it in the previous picture. Um, further. That's its orientation on the cairn itself at the moment. Uh, so all the laminations, the strata, as it were, go from north to south, approximately, uh, as you can see there. But I'm not convinced that that is one of the reasons that it was selected. Um, it's very striking looking at it this way, which I call the east-west orientation, but for reasons that you'll see shortly. Um, it's very striking that um, it, it uh, has this kind of um, very distinct, almost like a ruler, <laughs> ruler page. Um, and I think it was picked out for reasons to do with the area that it's in. And um, we'll go into that in a little more detail now. Um, this is my excuse to show you lots of nice pictures of the area. But I'm going to close shortly by saying that don't be... They're deluded. <laughs> You'll see what I mean. Uh, the geology and the, the, the landscape context for this find uh, is, is, is unique in, in England. Um, the two massive river systems draining a, an area of uh, extremely high land um, surrounded by a circle of mountains. So if this was the upper Estale, <laughs> you would, I would have mountains all the way around me, except for over there, um, down to the southwest. Uh, so you, you, when you're up there, you're in this massive bowl of hills, and this site, at uh, uh, Skull Waving, is sitting right at the focal point of where the two rivers come down and where they start disappearing off towards the sea. And in the, one of the river gorges, uh, you can see here extremely complicated uh, geological features, uh, very tortuous, um, gnarly bits of boreal volcanic uh, activity there. And... That's one point. The second point is that um, as you're approaching the cairn from that, that gorge, which is considerably <coughs> one way of, well, one of the ma major uh, routes up into the uplands here, which is still followed by Walker, uh, Major Walker's track today, you climb up that gully that I showed you earlier on, and then um, you come across the, uh, the cairn facade, and just as you come across the facade there with the, um, the, the rock with the, the art on it, the, the mountains start appearing <laughs> as if by magic above the top of the cairn. And when you get onto that uh, upper ridge of the, uh, of the mountain there, um, this is not quite the view from the cairn, it's the view from the Skull Laven Summit, about 200 metres to its south, but you get some impression of the nature of the, um, the, the, the mountain cirque in this photograph. Uh, with the Scorfell Massif here and Bowfell and uh, Crinkle Crags there, for those that know the area. I could go on at length about this. <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's remarkable. And you could, it is also possible to envisage uh, how people could have used this particular point in the landscape to observe animal movement and hunting strategies in the landscape here. And just to emphasise the monumentality, uh, that's 2,000 feet of mountain wall uh, visible from just uh, up the ridge near the cairn itself. 
And going back to the geological uh, selection, just to prove a point, really, about how significant I think this was, um, this is not an archaeological feature. This is just a frost and um, winter shattered boulder, only about a metre and a half high, further up the ridge from the cairn itself. But once you enter into the... Uh, it's a step landscape, and you can understand how those levels of landscape as one moves up towards where the axes were uh, uh, created. Uh, you can understand how people might have envisaged that landscape working and operating and how it might have in made them interpret where they were working from a spiritual uh, level. And the geology further up the ridge is, is absolutely remarkable in turn. You can see here, this is, this is entirely natural, uh, I've stuck a picture of the rock there just to give you the idea. Uh, but I'm sure they selected that rock because of the nature of the geology. And you can see another picture there with a nice archaeological ranging pole, but again, that's entirely geological. And again, just to hammer the point home, I think they were picking that rock for reasons to do with, where the, the, with the nature of the rock up there. Now, we've put this rock online, uh, so you can all chip in if you want. <laughs> It has its own website. Well, it's got a website with, in, with my name on it. And uh, you're welcome to email me if you've got any comments. Uh, you can zoom in on the rock and look at it yourself. You don't have to tell me about it uh, or ask me to tell you about it. But I wanted to finish, uh, really, by saying that these pictures I've shown you of the mountains are quite benign. But I was struck by a comment. Have oh, I got enough time for this, Andy? I was struck, struck for, by this comment that I came across in a book called The Power of Place by a guy called Vine Delora Jr., he was talking about how people used to approach uh, mountains in, in uh, Native America um, with a sense of fear and trepidation. and They didn't want to spend very long in those areas because they were really scared. And uh, if you've been up in the mountains and camped there and been washed out by flash floods or have been buried in deep snow, which I have had the privilege of being, you can understand exactly why this is a, not a landscape which is permanent, but it's a landscape that is continually in flux, and you never know from one day to the next what it's going to be like when you go up there. And I'm sure that this would have had an impact on the people that are up there too. Thank you very much.